Hi everyone, uh, it's Paul at Racing Vincent here again. A week or two ago when I did the last video, it was a catch up on uh, 2020, 2021, when I'd been uh, starting the rebuild of my 1939 M30, so pre-war makes. Um, and where I got to at the end of that last video update was just uh, walking through the different steps on the rear plungers so they're now ready for uh, final reassembly so i said that in this next video i'd look at the opposite end the front, uh, the front end uh, and the front forks but before i get to the front forks the first thing i had to do was to refit uh, head races to the frame so the frame had had quite a bit of work about five years ago from a friend of mine uh, and as it came back to me, it had been black powder coated, which is a very durable, good finish if you're going to use it for any meetings or even just using it on the road. I've really found that it's a good idea to black powder coat a frame. What I've found I tend to do is, for the last 10 years, 15 years or so, is actually get a, a, a frame black plaster, plastic powder coated. Uh, and obviously blasted first um, but once once that powder coatings on it it can then rub down quite well and you can spray over it with a two-pack and I find I get a better finish with a two-pack um, a black powder coating is very very good um, but it doesn't tend to give a good polished finish while a two-pack um, will allow you to get a much better finish so when the frame came back to me one of the first things i did was to give it a coat of two pack and obviously i rubbed it down first and i think i showed that in the last video just a, a quick scene of that out in the workshop so the first photograph here other than the frame sat on the on the bench in my back room is of the headstock and you'll see that the headstock as it was out in the workshop when I just finished giving it uh, a spray over. Um, it had, where the top head races would normally fit, they'd been removed as part of doing the repair work it needed doing. And actually, before this photograph was taken, they looked quite rusty. They have been sat in the workshop for a few years. But at this point, although it may not seem totally clear, uh, in the photo, I'd cleaned them out, and I think I'd used a wire brush for for, for uh, getting the worst of that. Uh, but I'd also removed the paint from around the top edge with a scalpel. Uh, and although that may seem quite insignificant, it's quite important because you want the head racers when they go back in to go in as flat as possible. And you'll see at the bottom of the machined area where the head races fit in, there's actually a groove all the way around. And on the left, there's a hole. And that is a greasing point. So both top and bottom on the Norton frames, there are grease nipples to allow greasing into that, the ball races for the, for the head races. And that's quite important. I still try and match up the hole in the head race to the hole in the frame as close as I can anyway, just you know, just just because it seems the right thing to do. Um, and then there's no chance of that galley getting blocked and stopping grease getting through. But if, if you do get it slightly off, then the grease should flow on that bottom track, that groove that's actually under the head race. So the head races, I've got lots of originals uh, and I could have fitted a couple of originals which were good enough. Um, so the photograph that should be showing now is of an original set of Norton uh, head racers. And you can see the design, not dissimilar to in the frame, there's a track at the bottom of the ball race, uh, the one on the right. Uh, that's where the balls sit. And you can see there's a track at the bottom, again, to let the grease flow round uh, and there'll be a there'll be a hole somewhere along that that race not all of them have them 
the bottom race that sits under the that sits on the fork crown, the bottom fork crown, doesn't have an oiling point that comes from the frame, so the bottom one doesn't need a hole in it. Likewise, these are actually the ones in the photograph. I think are actually t from the teleforks. And we made a set about uh, 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 we made sets of each a batch about four years ago, which are available on the website. So with a telefort model, uh, rather than the top crown that fits over the main T-piece crown, which is what happens with Gerdefort models, I'll come to that in a minute, but with the telefort models, the main T-piece, main fork crown, feeds up through the frame, and then the top race goes on, with obviously the balls inside. And that top race having a larger internal diameter than the earlier girder fork type. And then a large hex nut with a lip below and above screws down and that lip goes inside the top race. Therefore, as you can see in the photograph, the one on the left, so I think this is, I can't remember, but it, it certainly looks like this is a telefork set. And you can see that that top that nut on the left, the internal diameter of that is just slightly larger than the one on the right, signifying it's a telefort type. So in our case, uh, or in my case, I wanted to fit a girder fork type, and for that uh, we'd we'd also made those a couple of years ago. And you can see here there's a picture of a set from a catalogue. Well. As, as is a reoccurring theme with this build, as I'm sure you'll see, uh, I knew at the time, for a few years ago, I needed a, I was going to need a, a, a set. So I, I took a set at the time. Uh, and fitting the races to the frame is a relatively straightforward task, and it was in this case. I'd already cleaned up the frame, as the photograph shows of the headstock. And, sorry, a point I hadn't mentioned was before trying to fit those head races, I realised I needed to clean out the grease nipple threads. Um, even though you mask them off, there's always, or put something in the threaded area, they'll always get a bit of thread on, uh, a bit of paint on the thread. So the photograph it should be showing now is of their top headstock area of the throne. And as you can see, I'm chasing it with a tapered, Water BSC tap in a pin vise, and that's a relatively simple task. Just take it easy, make sure you've got it set up in line with what the thread's like. And if you use a taper tap rather than a plug tap, it should self straighten in line with the original thread. If you've already got the head races in, then normally the taper tap will bottom out, it'll hit the head race. Uh, before it actually gets the full thread. So you've got to be even more careful that you've got it lined up correctly. But that's why I chase the threads before I fit the races, so that I can use a taper tap. So that was a relatively simple task, just to uh, clean those threads, and then we can sit, uh, uh, fit grease nipples. And again, I'll show that in a moment. But having fitted the, um, having, chased for threads I was now able to fit the head races and fit them in a frame is no big deal providing that you've cleaned the area first as I showed so remove all traces of rust I use a wire brush you can use a flat wheel but a flat wheel can sometimes remove the tolerances should be an interference fit otherwise the uh, head races stand a chance of moving um, so I tend to use a wire brush and just a hand cloth emery if I need to, just to get it in pieces. And it's also important just to get rid of any nicks or chips so that when you're pressing or, or uh, uh, using a drift to knock the head races in, everything is done to make sure they go in level. And then as this photograph shows here, uh, and this one was actually done in the in the kitchen. Um, knocking the head races in 
is not particularly difficult if you normally you need something like a in this case a copper headed mallet and an alloy drift and i always recommend using an alloy drift wood wooden drift is too soft it'll just crush a wood uh, and obviously a steel drift can or a socket which you can sometimes use with other racers but you stand a chance of chipping the head racers so i'd always recommend like i've done here using an alloy uh, drift which I, I kind of got here uh, the top one's fine because the top race even when it, it when it bottoms out and hits the bottom face it will still sit proud as the next photograph shows it will sit proud of the frame uh, the headstock but the bottom one um, I use a slightly smaller alloy drift than this one. I haven't got a photograph, but that one is recessed into the headstock of the frame to protect the balls and dirt and crap getting into the, the head race in use. So that one is recessed up into the bottom of the headstock. But again, same, same rules apply, particularly with this one, because if you do get it in on a skew, it's quite difficult to get out. So as much as possible, make sure in that recess, all the uh, no knocks or bangs that can catch the head race as it goes in. Put the head race, I normally, for the bottom one, have the frame up, upended so that it's actually sitting on the plunger castings. Uh, and maybe put the frame up against a wall or something, or put sink just to hold it, and then I can tap in the bottom head race. In both cases, what you're listening for when you fit the head races is just for a slight difference of sound as the head race, which hopefully you're, you're holding the drift straight, so it's going in parallel to the machine faces, but you're listening for that slight difference of sound, which is when the head race bottoms out against the face. And you want them absolutely flush with that bottom face. Because if they go in at any slight angle, then actually the head races won't work as they're intended to do. You'll end up, you'll end up where, well, I, I'm assuming I, I've, I've, I've not touched wood, got it wrong so far, but I would imagine it'll tighten up as it spins around, finds a tight spot. So not not a terribly difficult job, and at the end of it, as you can see from the photograph. This is the top race fitted. You can see the hole on the left, which is where the greasing point, so it doesn't need to correspond to the grease nipple exactly. But it's always nice if it does. It means, you know, it's a direct route. Um, just a little, little point on that photograph. You'll see that um, there's part of the headstock is there's like a clamp. That's actually a, a complete pressed steel item. I be believe it was originally a pressed steel or a, a pressed out item that's brazed over the top of the headstock. And that's one of the signifiers of uh, well, from 1934 onwards to uh, I think pretty much the end of the rigid and uh, garden gate frames. That's a signifier of uh, uh, one of the signifiers of the uh, inter or Manx frame as that was intended to retain the strap of an Andre damper. So a CS1, uh, an overhead valve or a side valve frame would normally use the Bakelite Norton knob, um, which actually works very well. Uh, I've always found they worked well, but therefore they didn't have that extra piece brazed to the headstock. So that's just one of the identifying marks if anybody shows you an interframe or whatever look 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 for that i think it was in 1934 this was first fitted so prior to that andre dampers were fitted in the early 30s but actually rather than having a strap that located where this photo shows the strap located directly to the petrol tank so if you see a picture of pre-34, I think it was 34, might be 33, 34, around that era, um, the Andre damper was located to the, uh, to the petrol tank. There was a stud 
in the petrol tank, very close to where the petrol filler was. Uh, and as you can probably guess, I think they were more prone to splitting petrol tanks because of that. It was putting stress on the petrol tank, so that's why they changed it to the frame. Okay. So final picture before I move on to the forks themselves. It's just another picture of a top head race. And the only thing worth noting here is, and you just see at this point, I've added a transfer um, and personal choice. But this is one of my favourite Norton transfers. It, it was, it's probably slightly, the, um, probably slightly the wrong age for this frame in that it's a 1920s side valve engine and underneath it's got like a blue ribbon and then it's got the Norton logo in gold. Uh, I don't know exactly when they were fitted but I believe they were fitted to a lot of 1920s bikes and they may have been fitted into the 1930s but actually I think they look lovely and they always set off a restoration of 30s 40s Norton single. I think they that's a really pretty transfer to have on your headstock. So at that point, I've added it uh, and actually just lacquered over it with a little hand brush. Um, and uh, again, on our on our site, uh, this is the headstock transfer if you're interested. So next, moving on to the girder forks. Well, like the frame, the girder forks that I had for this bike uh, had actually had some work done to them quite a few years ago um, a lot of the, a lot of my projects are kind of like slow builds I'll do a bit of work on them then move on to another one um, but this set of forks uh, I'd actually had retubed if I remember right probably about eight or nine years ago um, and a quick shout out Jake Robbins did them at the time some of you may have heard of Jake Robbins but if not uh, I'll, if I remember, I'll try and put a link on this page. But um, Jake does very good work uh, restoring forks and frames, and is one of the few people I trust to retube girder forks. So the original girder forks, there is a picture here, um, and should be showing now. But the original girder forks, I don't have a picture of them before they were retubed, but they were rough. But there's a picture of the blades of the girder forks alongside a set of standard pre-war overhead valve or CS1 girder forks. Uh, and broadly speaking, in the mid to late 30s, there were anything I can't remember from 32, 33 onwards to the introduction of teleforks. Broadly speaking. There were three types of Norton forks. There was the more standard type that were fitted to side valve, overhead valve, and CS1 types. And they're identifiable in these photographs as being, well, they're the ones on the left. But you can see that at the bottom, they're slightly wider. And you can also see there's a side damper. So, uh, and the other main difference between the ones on the right is you can see that the, the peg for the brake plate is on the left. So that's an identifier that they are standard side valve, overhead valve, um, uh, and CS1 forks because the, the standard models and the CS1 overhead cam models pre war normally had a brake which was sorry, a front wheel which was like the rear wheel, it was the QD three bolt type, and the hub was like a pressing, it was like a press steel seven inch single. single a uh, uh, leading shoe hub on the left with a pressed steel brake plate and therefore because that hub 
was bolted on with three bolts. And the central hub was pretty much identical to the rear hub. Because it was slightly wider, um, the, hawks, uh, the front fork blades are splayed out. And they were normally fitted on the left, left side. So you had the brake plate, up, plate shown on the left side as in here. Um, the intertype, which aren't showing here, would be narrower normally because pre-war they used a single piece, single leading shoe, um, seven inch hub. Very similar to the type that was standardised across all road models post-war. But pre-war, that single that single hub or one piece hub was normally um, only used on inters and therefore the narrower forks were still required. And actually just like the fork blades on the right here, the peg would normally be on the right side. They'd use a similar pressed steel brake plate but for securing pre-war they had like a pressed steel um, plate that came off the main plate, plate riveted on and that engaged with that peg but obviously on the, on the inters that plate was reversed because it fitted on the opposite side. Now these look like inter blades but actually if you look at the photographs of them um, unpainted you'll see that actually when you turn it sideways while the overhead valve side valve type have a side damper as did the inters the type shown here don't have any provision for a side damper uh, and that's the sign that they're the later competition type so effectively pre-war Manx. So it's probably worth saying at this stage I'm not really an expert on the differences between this racing type of fork and the type with a side damper other than normally this racing competition type fork we used with parallel type check springs uh, I think a lot of people who know Nortons of the 30s will have seen uh, parallel check springs. But actually, if you look at the photographs, the period photographs, they were normally fitted to the competition bikes. And I think more often than not, the type were out the side damper. And I'm assuming that the lack of side damper and the parallel check springs were used in conjunction. A lot of people fit those check springs to the intertype forks with the side damper as well. And I'm sure that doesn't have any adverse effect. But I've noticed myself, I've got these similar competition forks on my own 1938 um, racing inter, uh, which I used to use for short circuit racing. Uh, and I noticed that it does seem to tramp a little bit sometimes. I do miss having a side damper, which I've got on other forks. Uh, and you do notice it that there isn't that side damper on it. Um, I'm sure that's because I haven't spent enough time adjusting the check springs, the parallel check springs, to get the benefits from them. Certainly on this bike, I'm going to fit those parallel check springs and... Uh, we do those sets, we do them We do them normally in stainless. We have had a few made with original dual nickel as well. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say next. Yes, I have reserved a set out of the, the, the check springs we sell already. Um, so uh, I'll show those a little bit later, um, but at some point or other, uh, I'll be assembling and fitting those parallel check springs and it will be interesting I'm hoping ultimately to have this bike on the road uh, it'll be interesting to uh, have a mess around with them have, have a play with them they can be adjusted 
Uh, they've got left and right hand threads, top and bottom. So the, the idea being they could be adjusted in situ. It's quite clever. Um, and I don't know, I'm not quite sure just what they were in intended to to do that the normal side dampered uh, forks um, didn't do or didn't do as well. Um, I'm sure there's people out there that do know that. By all means, I'd like to hear. I'd like to. I'd like to know what it is. But I'm assu assuming that they gave some form of damping. I would imagine on a on a large on a long race like the TT, the side dampers might slacken off. They may wear and not work as well. While having those parallel uh, uh, check springs doing a similar job of I assume damping the forks that uh the the rate was constant um you know as the as the side discs worn uh on 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 the forks with side dampers uh these competition type it wouldn't wear it'd stay constant and i assuming there's also a slight weight saving um in the unsprung weight of not having the damper mechanism but i would have thought that would have been minimal but anyway, there you go. Um, so that's a bit about the background of the competition forks. It's probably worth saying that um, since I first started this, re uh, this rebuild, I've got another rebuild going along in parallel, uh, um, which is a 1937 road going into uh, with a rigid uh, chassis. And you may have seen photographs of that in a semi-built state uh, on on my Racing Vincent website, but actually the fork blades for that uh, I've also had rebuilt. Fortunately, the tubes were just too far gone uh, and just looked quite quite unsafe. So ultimately, I made the decision to have those retubed as well. Quite a big undertaking, certainly not one I want to do myself. Uh, in this case, I was talking to that. Fantastic, that very well-known stalwart of the uh, single knocker Cammy, uh, Cammy Norton, Stu Rogers, who, who's an old friend uh, some years ago, and he offered to, to uh, retrieve them for me. And you can see here, the um, last couple of photographs on fork blades is actually the ones for this bike, the competition type we've been talking about, next to a set of inter fork blades and you can see that they're pretty much the same remembering they've been retubed so you know things should go back all in the same position but they won't be absolutely identical but um you can see here the, the that key difference we talked about pretty much the same width um but the inter type have that provision for a, a damper uh, if you look carefully, there's also one other difference in that the inter type have kind of little lugs um, uh, with holes in them which hold the headlamp brackets on girder forks. And if you see all the um, overhead valve, side valve type forks, they also have that provision for the front, front uh, uh, headlight, two little lugs. The uh, competition type don't have that. Okay, so that probably about covers it for this video. I've given a little bit about the background to these forks. Um, but in the next video, I'll show you the other components of those forks and the work I've done so far. Um, I've still got some work to do on those forks. I've put them to one side, but I have got most of the components made and ready now uh, just for the final assembly. So. Uh, next episode, I'll just quickly walk through some of the other components of the front forks. Okay. Thanks for watching. Speak soon.